tuned into Quick Charge, the high voltage podcast bringing you the top stories in electric vehicles and sustainable energy daily. And it's all powered by electric. Welcome to Quick Charge. It's September 30th, 2024, and I'm your host, Joe Boris. We don't talk a lot about Mazda here on electric because Mazda doesn't have a lot of electric vehicles. But that's starting to change as the new Mazda EZ6 electric vehicle goes on sale with a starting price of under $25,000. Now, a little bit of a caveat here. It's only on sale right now in China. That's because the car was co-developed by Mazda and Chinese state-owned Changing Auto. The EZ6 is one of two new electric offerings that debuted back in April. The other was a CX-5, CX-50 size crossover called the Arata. But the EZ6 seemed closer production then with a promised on sale date later this year. Mazda lived up to its promise and put the EZ6 on sale officially starting Saturday for pre-order in China. And while our sources, the Chinese car blogs Auto Home and Car News China, were a little bit fuzzy on the actual price, the translation seems to indicate a starting price of just 160,000 yuan, which is a tick over $22,800 as this was written. One thing that's less fuzzy, however, is that there are four extended range EV or e-rev versions of the car read hybrid, along with three fully electric BEV versions available for order at the pre-sales launch. Now, this is a gorgeous car. This is Mazda's first global sedan and the first update to the six series or six class sedan that we've seen since about 2014. So it's been about 10 years. And even though that vehicle was really good looking, it never really sold well in the U.S., Because of that, there is some doubt as to whether or not this vehicle will ever actually see U.S. shores. But if it does, that would be cool. Despite its low price, the base version of the newest Mazda does get leather seating surfaces and higher trim versions spliced leather and suede, which is probably Alcantara, together. There's also a 14-speaker Sony audio system available, along with 64-color ambient lighting, zero-gravity front seats, which means the seats can recline to a near-flat position, and a panoramic glass roof. The fully electric EZ6 is reported to be equipped with a single electric drive motor, putting out 190 kilowatts, about 250 horsepower, that can be had with either a 56 or a 68 kilowatt hour battery pack, good for a Chinese range estimate of up to 370 miles. Top speed of either model is an electronically limited 105 miles an hour. You really don't need much more than that. The EREV model, and again, I really do hate that acronym, so like that's in the article. I'll put it in the notes here super annoying, is equipped with a 93 horsepower 1.5 liter generator paired to a 215 version of the electric motor, feeding electrons to a lithium iron phosphate battery. Range on battery power alone is supposed to be about 80 miles with a maximum comprehensive range quoted as about 800 miles. Now, as I said before, we don't talk too much about Mazda because they don't have many electric cars. We talk about Tesla all the time because, of course, they are all electric cars. And today, Tesla is declaring victory on achieving its September milestones for its autonomy roadmap. But the most important milestone of them all is missing. Earlier this month, Tesla released an AI product self-driving roadmap that included milestones the team aimed to accomplish in the coming months. With September coming to a close and Tesla starting the rollout of supervised full self-driving for Cybertruck, Elon's sycophants are already celebrating Tesla accomplishing all the milestones. Ashok Ilaswamy, Tesla's head of autonomous software, and Musk himself commented on the post in approval. However, as Ilaswamy points out, there's already a small caveat that only some Cybertrucks are currently getting full self-driving, almost a year after the first deliveries and the, quote, end-to-end on highway, which is the use of neural nets throughout the whole highway driving process, only being shipped on Cybertrucks right now. Therefore, the vast majority of Tesla vehicles with FSD won't get it in September as planned. With that said, there's an even bigger problem with claiming victory on the September milestone than end-to-end highways. Interventions. As we reported when Tesla first released the roadmap, this is a problematic goal in the first place as Tesla never released any official miles between intervention data, which begs the question three times what? Without official data from Tesla, we have to rely on crowdsource data, which Musk himself has positively commented on. We currently have just over 2,500 miles of FSD 12.5.2 crowdsource data, and it shows 35 miles between critical disengagement and 17 miles between disengagement in general. If we go from an average of all the 12.5.1 versions, it shows that 12.5.2 is actually worse. It's a regression because over more than 14,000 miles, 
those versions have averaged 174 miles between critical disengagements. Just in case, we can also compare it with FSD version 11, but that also exposes 12.5.2 as a regression. The only clearly positive thing about FSD's improvement that we can gather from this data is that Tesla went from an average critical disengagement every 109 miles with FSD 11 to one every 166 miles on average when all versions of version 12 are combined. And you again realize that only 2,500 miles have been driven on 12.5.2. What this basically means to people who can't look at this and immediately intuit it is that version 11 was better than 12.5.1 and 12.5.1 was better than 12.5.2. So it just gets worse and worse for Tesla, but it gets better and better for Ford owners because Ford is now giving EV buyers a free home charger and more as part of its new Power Promise marketing promotion. Starting tomorrow, October 1st, all new Ford electric vehicle buyers, F-150 Lightning, Mach-E, and E-Transit, will receive a free home EV charger. To sweeten the deal, Ford also covers standard installation costs. The offer is Ford's way of making it easier for drivers to transition to electric. Following a 2024 survey, Ford found that 89% of EV shoppers are more likely to purchase if they have home charging. Meanwhile, 92% of owners find that charging at home is as easy as charging their phones. According to Ford, most drivers don't realize the true benefits of driving an EV, and one of the biggest is waking up to a full tank every day with the ability to charge at home. Now, charging at home is super important, but so is charging on the road. And if you're an RV enthusiast looking to switch to electric, that can be a challenge, especially if your goal is to get as far away from the grid as possible. That's why this new electric RV concept from Thor, packing 140 kilowatt hour battery and a 500 mile range, thanks to its extended range generator, is so, so interesting. Visually similar to Thor's existing Vegas Class A motorhome and co-developed by Thor and commercial EV manufacturer Harbinger, this quote-unquote world's first hybrid RV combines a gas-powered range extender that can generate electrical power to feed the RV's 140 kilowatt hour battery pack. The batteries then send power to Harbinger's e-axle, and that's a proprietary electric axle that combines a motor, inverter, and gearbox into a single unit at the back of the RV's ladder-style frame. Along with the range extender, the battery should be good to deliver, quote, an estimated 500 miles of range. And yes, while that is a totally disingenuous claim in the same way that Toyota and Ram talking about unlimited range is disingenuous, to their credit, they're not trying to position this as an EV that happens to have a range extender. They're fully embracing the hybrid label. Part of that, I think, is related to the fact that most people who are buying RVs are significantly older than the general car buying population. And the older generation has lived with the word hybrid now for 27 years. While we might not be scared of the word EV because we've been dealing with Tesla for the last 15 years, for someone in their 70s, that still seems like a really new product. And they really do think of electrification and vehicle batteries as new technology, as ridiculous as that might seem. But hybrid is something they understand. Prius is something they've been hearing about now for more than a third of their lives. So this is a really smart marketing play. And I think for this market, it makes a ton of sense and, uh, you know, something I can definitely get behind. The top comment so far by Leo O'Connor, on trips, I could go charger to charger. And if there's a gap or a charger is out, I could use gas to get to the next one in a pinch. I assume it's electric range is between 100 and 200 miles. I think that's probably right. I hope it charges fast. Now, keep in mind, the Harbinger e-axle has multiple gears, so it's not like a single-speed Tesla that loses efficiency as it gains speed. You can use that torque multiplication to stay at the lower RPM where the electric motor is more efficient and still maintain decent highway speeds. Will it go 80 or 90 or 100? Probably not, but will it tool around 65, 70, wherever you need to go? Absolutely. Thor hasn't revealed pricing or interior features yet, but again, it looks a whole lot like the Vegas RV, so go to Thor's website check out the Vegas. That should give you a sense of some of the available floor plans. But Harbinger made headlines recently by announcing that its commercial EVs would have price parity with diesel versions by the end of this year, 2024. If that's true, the first production hybrid electric RV from Thor could come to market with a price tag that is super, super competitive to other diesel models. And that seems like big news to me. Now, 
we like to close these episodes off talking about sustainability, talking about renewable energy resources. Today is no different, but we're going to take a little bit different angle. When we think about massive wind turbines, we don't often think of the massive heavy equipment that goes into putting them in place. Well, this is as big as it gets. This is the world's largest electric crane. It's built by Mamouet and it has a massive 6,000 metric ton lifting capacity. That is over 14 and a half million pounds. Mamut says its new SK6000, quote, redefines the scale of human construction, allowing large energy and infrastructure projects to build from bigger pieces in parallel, reaching first power sooner and more cost effectively. We have to believe them, especially when the biggest trains we've ever written about on Electric and I search were a pair of 400 ton Gottwald Generation 6 mobile harbor cranes that are recently deployed at the port of San Diego. Those have less than a tenth of the SK6000's lifting capacity. It is simply on another level. Quote, this crane is truly a world record feat of engineering with a production schedule to match. Hundreds of colleagues have been directly involved with its development across the business. That's according to Gavin Kerr, Director of Global Services at Mamlet. He adds, there are very few companies on earth, if any, that could have brought this crane into reality, and we are immensely proud to be able to do so. Now, Typically, I would have left off that last sentence because, frankly, we don't need to give companies a victory lap, especially if they're not sponsors, right? We'll give you all the victory laps you want if you're paying us for it. But if we have to genuinely report the news, we try to keep it at least a little bit objective. And having somebody who is working for the company talking about how great they are and how nobody else could have done it does seem a little bit sketchy. But the fact remains, nobody else has done anything even approaching this, except for possibly the old, you know, big musky out in Ohio, but that was a generation ago. So kudos to them. This thing is crazy. And Mamo believes the SK6000 will be ideally suited to a role in the growing offshore wind industry, where the rapid growth of physical components in recent years has led to supply chain issues, issues that in many cases can be summed up with, quote, this equipment simply isn't big enough. Well, this new crane will not have that problem thanks to its ability to lift 3,000 tons to a height of more than 220 meters. With that kind of capability, Mamlet believes the SK6000 will ensure that wind farms in the planning phase today can be safely executed and delivered tomorrow. Now, if you look at this picture, you will realize that in the background there, those are 40-foot containers. Those are 30-ton little red excavators down there. Those are massive massive multi-ton top loaders there at the bottom of this page. We are talking about equipment that weighs 20 and 30 tons, and you can't even see where the boom operator is supposed to sit from this photo. So this is an absolutely mammoth gargantuan crane. If you think you've seen a bigger one, you are definitely mistaken. That's all we've got for September. Tomorrow begins October and a whole new era of electric and um, that's not true, but we're just going to have spooky Halloween sounds. And I think that's going to be fun. You're going to love it. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss it.